sermon is brought to you by Pastor Robert Dahmer of St. Mark's Lutheran Church. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. The text for this morning is written in St. Luke chapter 19, verses 11 to 27. Since the text is long, the congregation may be seated. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable. Because he was nigh unto Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. And then came the first, saying, Lord, thy talent gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a little, have authority over ten cities. And he said likewise to the second person, who said, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he said unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knowest I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou money into the bank, that thou are my coming, I might have required mine own with you three. And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. They said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given. And from him which hath not, even that which he hath shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. So far the text. Dearly beloved, many people look at today's text as a lesson in usury how to invest your money that you might have the greatest gain. Now we know that usury, charging exorbitant interest, is wrong at any time. And in the Old Testament, God forbade usury of any kind between the children of Israel. And when Jesus came, he set the matter straight when he said, give and don't expect anything in return. Listen to his words from the Sermon on the Mount. And if ye lend to them which whom you hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing in return and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be children of the highest, for he is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. And again he said, Give, and it shall be given unto you in good measure. Pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. This text was not spoken 
about Jesus as a financial advisor, but in answer to the question, when will the kingdom of God appear? The disciples and the Savior had been walking from Jericho to Jerusalem on the very day before Palm Sunday. And the disciples couldn't wait to get there because they thought as soon as they arrived at Jerusalem, immediately the kingdom would appear. And Jesus would be sitting on a throne, governing the whole world with righteousness and judgment. And they knew from the miracles that he could dispose an enemy just by saying so. Now, what they needed to learn was that there are no glory days until the end of time. And to make that clear, Jesus told this parable of that man who went to get a distant kingdom and returned, making the point that real glory will not be ours until Jesus returns again on the last day. So the parable makes two points. It tells the disciples there's going to be no glory day in Jerusalem. And secondly, that he was entrusting them with some very precious gifts that he wanted them to use for his benefit. Now the text says, a certain nobleman went to a far country to receive himself a kingdom and to return. Now the nobleman of that parable is Jesus Christ. And the far country he went to was when at the ascension he went to the right hand of his father where he says all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. He received a great kingdom and yet that would not be fulfilled completely until he came again on the end of time. Now we know from the parable certain servants were displeased with that nobleman. In fact, as he was going, they sent a messenger after him saying, we will not have that man rule over us. He was referring to the Jewish nation that didn't love Jesus. They didn't want his rulership. In the Old Testament, they tortured and killed the prophets. And at the time of Christ, they nailed him to the cross because they held that it was he was an imposter for claiming to be the son of God, something that every Jew still believes today. Now in our day, most people will not have that man rule over them. They might believe in God, but they don't want Jesus Christ ruling over them. Think of the media and the popular culture which redefines morality by accepting sexual perversion or the murder of infants because they claim that the words of the Bible are not true. Or think of the tremendous power of materialism that even attracts us to find our greed satisfied in possessions and in pleasure. Or think of the evil of all the kingdoms of the world whose goal is economic development and not to rule men by the Ten Commandments. Or think of those new age theologians that tell our young people, if you hold to everything in the Bible, why, that's old fashioned. Sin only destroys your good image. The one word the world will not accept is repentance because it implies that we're by nature sinful and unclean and that we need the forgiveness that Jesus Christ brings. These people might try to please God by their good works, but they'll never escape the verdict that Jesus proclaims on the last day, as you heard in the text, bring those people to me who said, I will not reign over them 
and I will destroy them before your very eyes. Now before this nobleman went to get his kingdom, he called all his servants together and he gave each one of them 10 pounds. And he didn't tell them how to use them. He just said, use them for my benefit. And when he came back, he found a man that had gained 10 extra pounds. And he said unto him, well done. And he made him master over 10 cities. And then there was another one who said, I have gained five pounds. And the nobleman said, thou shalt have control over five cities. Now the nobleman rewarded these people not on the basis of what they received, but on the basis of their attitude, that they used everything in their power to please and do the will of their nobleman. Just as the nobleman gave money to his servants, so the Lord has given us something more precious than money. He's given us the precious gospel of Jesus Christ. And just as that nobleman didn't tell them how to invest their money, so Jesus doesn't tell us how we should use his gifts, but simply expects us to use them out of thankfulness and love to him. And he promises a reward. Now we know we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace without any merit or worthiness in us. And if God were to reward any of us for our ability to use our means properly for his benefit, I don't think we'd make heaven. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And yet, according to his infinite mercy, he promises to reward the fruits of our faith on the last day with everlasting life. You know, you're all different. You have different gifts. You have different abilities. And all that God expects of you is that you use them to proclaim his word for others. And that's not our work, really, but the work of the Word of God. We can't create faith. We can't bring anyone to faith. We can't extend the kingdom of God. We can't even convince someone to come to church. That's purely the work of the Word. You and I are simply channels of Jesus Christ through which he proclaims his word to others. And the important thing is that we use the gifts we have in view of the fact that Judgment Day is coming. Now for many of us, using our gifts has to do with how we go about our daily work. We read in the Bible, servants, Obey your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as singleness of heart, fearing God, knowing that the, of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord's Christ. The amount of work we do is not important. But it is important is the attitude we do it. And if we do it as unto Christ, the way we work will be a convincing testimony of the faith in our hearts without ever speaking a word. Now, the gift we pray for most is the gift of love, the gift to put our fellow man and his needs above our own. For Christian love is a powerful testimony to a loveless world. Think of the early Christians. They were hated by the Romans, you know that. Many were crucified, they were fed to animals in the Colosseum. And yet the early Christians couldn't help but say, behold how they love one another. 
what better thing could be said about St. Mark's congregation than behold how they love one another. That wasn't the case of this unfaithful servant. The important issue is not whether he put his money under the bed or whether he invested it. The important issue was his faith. That man didn't believe in God. And he was afraid of God. And he wouldn't use his means because he was only thinking about himself. He's like the kind of Christian in the long run who has no use for God in his life and certainly wouldn't extend it. Such people think only of themselves. What have I got to get out of this? What am I going to gain? And that kind of attitude puts them in the category of the scoffers who pick and choose the word of God to fit their personal agenda. To be deprived of God's word is to sink into everlasting death. And so in the final analysis, all of us are instruments of the Holy Spirit whose call is to proclaim the gospel of repentance and remission of sins. And how you do that is purely a matter of your own faith. And if we've learned to love Jesus as the one who forgives our sins and gladdens our hearts, we can't help but show in our lives the thankfulness for what he has done for us and in the end to receive the reward of our faith, everlasting life in heaven. Amen.